Hi, my name is Lewis, and I'm coming in with the Sunday School lesson for December 9th, and this lesson is entitled, Love and Serve God. We'll be reading our text from Joshua chapter 24, 1 through 3a, verses 13 through 15, and verses 21 through 24. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, and called for the elders of Israel, and for their heads, and for their judges, and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed. Excuse me. And I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you built not, not. And ye dwell in them of the vineyards and olive yards, which ye planted not, do ye eat. Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen you, the Lord, to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord your Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and his voice will we obey. Okay, so, uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this lesson. We thank you for this, this text in Joshua. We thank you for the title, Love and Serve God. We hope that it's a um, that that we become more and more prone to loving you with all of our all of our hearts, all of our might, and all of our soul, just as last week's lesson taught us, and also to serve you, to put all these things now in action, not just be people who would say these things, but people who would also do these things, and so we come to our, our key verse, which is verse fifteen, which is a very very um, popular verse of scripture. It says, And if it seem evil unto to you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so there we have it. Um, this is a pretty much clear-cut lesson uh it doesn't require a whole lot of teaching skill uh, to actually tell you what's going on here um we know that they had sent that the, the israelites had sent 12 spies into the land of canaan uh very many years ago and of the 12 spies 10 of them came back with an evil report saying oh my god we are like grasshoppers in these people's um in these Amorites and these Canaanites uh, eyes, we, we're like we're dwarfed by their by their grandeur. Like they were giving all credit to what they were seeing with their eyes instead of believing what what the Lord can do. But two of them, which I, I think I made mention in last week's lesson, two of them was Joshua and Caleb, and they believed the Lord so much so that they did not fear the the people of this land. They, 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 they pretty much uh, trusted and, and, and confided in the God of Israel who has kept them all these years, who they have seen, you know, pretty much protect them throughout this wilderness experience, have given them food from on high, have given them water from out of rocks, has protected them from pirates along the way in the, in the wilderness. And so... It wasn't too hard of a stretch for Joshua and Caleb to actually put their, their faith to work and put their faith in action in, in the fact that they were trying to 
they were trying to um they were trying to not sell but you know they were trying to um I'm trying to think of the word they were trying to I'm gonna use the word they were trying to sell this faith to the rest of the people who did not have faith and they were trying to sell, you know, the idea that God has been for us all this time. What is the what are these people to God? You know, they got they got the land that God said that we we are to own. And if God said it, then he's more than more than uh, enough to actually prove his word in us. And so the the two good reports came from two men and because of this the people were murmuring. They were they were thinking, "Oh my God, this is it for us. We we've been led here to you know to die in the wilderness," and God just had enough with them and said, "Look, I'm going to kill all of you." And Moses stepped in and said, "No, don't kill all of them. Otherwise, the land that we came from and the people that are witnessing you know uh, your word in us in action, they're going to see that the Lord led led us all here just to kill us all dead." So now, no, I don't want your name to be, and this is Moses, you know, the the, the intercessor in Moses, the, this very important thing that Moses' life brought out of himself, that he was able to love this people so much, so even to his own detriment, he, he, were, he was able to love this people so much that he got angry when they, when they were acting up, he was like a father to them. And it, it just, it was so, it's so telling in his life how much he loved this people that he stepped in when God says, stand aside, Moses, I'm going to kill all of them. And I'm going to make of my people through your lineage. He was going to do it. And God was, and God, you know, if he has the will to do it, he will do it. But he knew Moses' character. He knew Moses would, would then defend the rest of the people and also you know, bring to mention, you know, what kind of reproach it would be among all the nations. If if it was seen that God was, was send all these people, deliver them out of the great hands of the Egyptians, lead them through the wilderness only to just kill them all dead. And so Moses, uh, Moses uh, interceded for them and protected his people from the wrath of God through his intercession. And so we see, uh, we see also... And I'm just I'm doing like a wrap up of, you know, of events, you know, memorable or key events leading up to this point. Now, in this text, in Joshua, Joshua is the leader. Why? Because Moses is dead. Uh, even says so much in um, in in chapter. I think it was in chapter one where in, in, in Joshua says Moses is dead. Who's going to lead us? And Joshua's the next man in line. And so how why did Moses die? Why did. Moses not was not able to see the lamb. Well, it was because because he um if I'm not mistaken, I, and I could be wrong because I, I'm you know I'm a little foggy on the uh, chapters or the the books before before this particular text. I didn't do um I did you know what I'm gonna leave that alone. <laughs> I did my my research on today's chapter and and you know as far as jo Joshua chapter one going on up until this point, and now they're they're to the point where they're in, they have already spied out the land, they have they have already you know made it their 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 um their business to go into the land, and now people are are at this point saying look, uh, we're kind of hesitant, uh, I don't know. Is this for us? And we still are latching on to the ideas of the old ways. Uh, we still have, you know, you know, remnants of of these things that that we're bringing over. And how can this be when this is a new generation of people that came through the wilderness? This was the the young generation. Remember, the first generation of people were wiped out, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb and all the children uh, that were, I, I believe. 20, 20 something years in age of age and old uh, younger and so these these little ones who the elders said oh if we go into this land our little ones are going to be are going to perish at the hands of these amorites at the hands of these you know these canaanites and so god was very angry with them he said okay 
since you think you and, and Moses stepped in, since you think your little ones were going to perish, guess what I'm going to do with your little ones? I'm going to prove my word to you and to anybody who, who ever doubts me that my little ones or your little ones are going to be used by God to take this land. And this is what's going to happen. And God made good on his word. And Joshua was the leader of such people. Now, these same people, these little ones that grew up in the wilderness are now at the brink of entering into the land and finally taking it for themselves, you know, making God's word good in and, in and of, of themselves. I'm sorry if I'm like uh, reiterating or, you know, bumbling over my words. But OK, so verse one says, and Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem. And called for the elders of Israel. Now there are elders because remember in, in Moses' day, Moses could not handle all these people by himself. And at the behest of his, at the, it was his father-in-law. He was a, like a priest um, of Midian. Um, at the behest of his father-in-law, his father-in-law said, "Look, Moses, this stuff is too much for one man to do. Um, use a little wisdom." Uh, you know, take out from among all these tribes, elders, rulers of these people so that they can report to you, but always and, and do the micromanaging on their end and leaving you to be free to do the, the more the more important thing, which is lead us as a whole, lead us by the hand of God and, you know, go go into prayer for us. Go go into all uh, listening for God's word for us so that you can report for us so that you can only focus on that and be sure that you're doing what you're supposed to do so that we're following the right way. And so this is this is where, uh, where these elders came from. And so he called for the elders of Israel now and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers. And they presented themselves before God. Now, these are all the big wigs. These are all the politicians. These are all the people that were, or, that were marked for servitude or ser servanthood among their tribes to be a go-between between, between the leader of the whole nation, or I should say the whole people, because the nation has become until they go into the land and establish the law and establish the temple. All these things are, are done and become a a, um, a theocracy, a nation under God, under God's rule, where God is the, the sovereign and God is the one who says this and people do that. Where God says, don't do this and people don't do that. It was a theocracy. And the only way that they can actually hear God is by a, a, a man would be in tune with God. God would use the oracle of a man, the man as an oracle for the people. And so... Pretty much, God chose Moses to be his prophet to these people, these wanderers, these people that escaped the hand of Egyptians. And now they're, they're wandering through the wilderness and they have come to the brink. Moses is dead and Moses passes the baton over to Joshua. Joshua now becomes a military head leader, not necessarily a prophet, but Joshua is just as important, just as... Um, exemplary in his in his service to God in that he believes God and his this is told from the very beginning that even Joshua and his friend Caleb they were together um you know uh faithful and believing and so that was enough and God trusted to them that they would lead the people Joshua being the head so he gathers all these people all these people are, are gathered in Shechem Verse 2, and Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, now Joshua is speaking in behalf of God, just like Moses would have spoken in behalf of God. But this is more like a um, more like a, um, a recitation. A recitation of things that has already been conveyed by the prophet Moses. And so Joshua said unto all of you, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwell on the other side of the flood in old time. Now the other side of the flood means uh, on, during the time of Noah, on that side of time and on that side of the flood, where Noah was alive, where you know there were different people 
under Noah who were just children who came up even after the flood. Uh, I'm sorry, you know, let me um, backtrack a little. Um, the ideas and the the ways that people were behaving in before the flood, it kind of crept in even after the flood because of the human nature on the inside. Now this is now this is a, a lot to say about our human nature. Uh, when the lesson is telling us to love and serve God, we still have a love in our from our flesh to this world, and I'm saying that very carefully. The love that we have for this world is connected to this flesh. And because we have love for the things of this world through the flesh, we, through the flesh, are willing to to serve the things of the world to cater to the flesh. Same idea goes for these people. These people never knew anything about what was before the flood. These were young people. That, that that God spared their lives in the middle of the wilderness and killed off the elders in the middle of the wilderness with the exception of Joshua and Caleb. So how did they know anything before the flood? This is speaking directly to the human nature of humanity. And so he's actually speaking to human nature, which is now relevant. Even if we read this scripture today for us, we make it relevant because there was no one before the flood at this point. Uh, Moses is dead. Uh, Moses' father is dead. Mo uh, and Abraham has long passed. You know, all these patriarchs are long gone. For uh, over 500 years, I, I should say 400, 430 years, disconnects from, you know, from, uh, from uh, I'm trying to think of um, the... the the coat of many colors, the kid. Oh my God. I can't think of his name. Joseph. <laughs> you know, a whole bunch of hundreds of years is disconnecting these people from that time. And even from that time, 400 years prior is disconnected from Abraham. And so you got the children of Israel, you know, entering into a land because of a famine. But before that, it, it's been a, a whole host of years. Uh, since Abraham. So even that, Abraham is disconnected from Noah because nobody lived past the flood except Noah, his three sons, and his three sons' wives, and his wife uh, uh, herself. And so, you know what? Oh, I, I, I was about to digress, and it's not, it has nothing to do with um, today's lesson. Anyway, and so now these young people, these people coming into this new land, have received the law, have have now, you know, uh, set up a camp where people are now in in some kind of rulership authority within within each and every tribe. Now they're about to move into this land and ration out the land between all the tribes and become a nation with a constitution. A constitution being the law, the law that Moses brought down. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time. Even Terah, the father of Abraham. Now he's, now he's not talking about beyond the flood, but he's talking about after the flood, talking about Terah. And Terah, which is the father of, uh, of Nacor, and they served other gods, which is the father of Abraham and Nacor. Now Abraham was pulled out of this family and Nacor was still there. And because Terah still latched on to his, his old gods, he was not going into any new land, not into the Canaan lands. He was not presented to the Canaan lands. Uh, I, I make it a very, I made an interesting note that when they, whenever you hear these are the generations of Shem or these are the generations of the sons of Noah, these are the generations of this person or that person. Uh, it never said these are the generations of Abraham. It actually said these are the generations of Terah. And this, this is very, very, very important for even us today because God has called a people out of a world, a world in which they were they were living and dwelling. Terah being the, the patriarch of that society was called out of that place. And he had two sons. 
uh, actually had three sons, um, if I'm not mistaken. But Nacor and Abraham are the more um, prominent. And of these sons, he calls out Abraham because not only did Terah still latch on to his old ways, but Nacor, because he's with his father and has stayed over there in in in, in the um, in their land, he he was still. I think they were in Haran, um, and they stay they stayed in Haran, but did not go forward with Abraham out of you know not only Ur of the Chaldees, but from their family, from that whole family. He, he went by himself. He took Lot only. And with his wife and, and, and all his stuff, he, he packed up his bags and went. And so it never said these are the generations of Abraham only because God called the father of Abraham out. He said these are the generations of Terah. And so it was is a remarkable thing because we can be called into this great life in Christ Jesus and we can fall by the wayside, but our children can go on and live a life in Christ. They can still be affected by Christ. They can still go on in Christ. I may fail this this life. I may fail God. I may I may say down the line, look, I don't want to believe in this no more. I don't want to go through. I'm done. These are the generations of Lewis. But guess what? Lewis is not the important person here. The story goes on with my son. My son goes on and he becomes a great man of God. And he does. And so it's all about individual responsibility, individual choices. And Tara made his choice. This is why I think is mentioned with Tara here. He says, um, even Tara, the father of Abraham and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. Now, they served other gods is not meant is not talking about Abraham, even though he came from that and did indeed serve those other gods with his father under his father in that land in those days in that time. But because Abraham was called out, he was no longer a follower of those things, but they remained Terah and Nacor. And verse verse three says this in so many words. He says, and I took your father, Abraham, from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed. And so from the flood, you know, from the flood coming over out of the flood into Noah, into Terah, into Abraham, he put, he's extracting, he's leading a, a, a righteous seed through Abraham. And so now he's leading them from this, from the other side of the flood into the new side of the flood. And even to Abraham, who is, who heard the voice of God and follow God, he now is being led throughout the Canaan lands all his life, not knowing that the, the very Canaan lands that he's, you know, treading on is the very land that God promised him. It was his and his seed and his seed after him. These young people are now coming into this land, into a land that Abraham has already treaded, that his that their father has already been there. And this is a very important um, distinction, because now after all these years, however, did the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Girgashites and the uh, Hivites and the Jebusites, all these people, you know, how did they ever get into this land and 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 become, you know, inhabitants of this land? And so it's not that Abraham kicked them out, but a whole lot of history has gone by, and these people are coming and going, you know, nomadic people, tribal people, you know, fighting for this land, fighting for that land. They they and they, at this point, there is there are some semblance some semblance of um of borders. In this land between the ites, between all the Canaanites. But before that, God has already promised Abraham that he was going to give him a land that he was already treading on. And so this right here, Abraham, I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed. Now it jumps to verse 13. And I have given you a land for which you did not labor. Meaning... There was already work being tilled and done in this land. 
you, you, you see how the spies went into the land and they brought back a cluster of grapes so big that the cluster of grapes are like a handful like this. Now, I don't know about you, but if I saw a grape this big, I'd be happy that I love grapes. And even though they're this small, they're delicious. But if I saw a big grape like this, I would be beside myself. And it just tells you how cultivated this land was. And it was already ready. These people did not even move into the place. It was already ready because of the inhabitants had learned the land already and tilled the land. It was already done. So they were pretty much um, tenants of God in this land, you know, performing their human due diligence and, you know, what they do to survive in this land. But they did not know the word of God was against them to, to begin with. They did not know that t their time was coming until these people were were approaching the, the brink of their land. And these people were afraid of these Israelites because they heard beforehand what miracles and wonders had happened for them and against all their enemies as they were moving from Egypt through the wilderness, approaching the Canaan land. So he says, I have given you a land for which, for which you dwelt and did not labor and cities which you built not and you dwell in them of the vineyards and the olive yards which you planted not do you eat. And so all these things are yours. You have come into this land. This stuff was already ready. It was like as though you just moved into a house already furnished. You didn't even have to work for it. You didn't have to pay no bills. You didn't have to pay, pay no uh, mortgage. You don't have to do anything. The water is coming in. The food is already in the refrigerator. You got closet, closets full of clothes. God has already provided all these things for you. The structure is sound because it was already built, meaning the building, the house that you got, the cities were already built. Done. Done and done -er. And so these people have come into something that they did not have to lift a finger for. And so... God, God, in essence, showed these young people, including the rulers and the, the leaders and Joshua and Caleb themselves, showed them how great his word was from the very beginning when he said, I'm going to take your little ones and your little ones are going to take this land. And so what they saw, what these elders, what these people remember as far as reports were concerning, concerning the older people, what they saw was that they doubted God and put shackles on God and put bars around God and put God inside of a box and said, oh, our children are going to get murdered when they come into this place because God is not that equipped. This is what, in essence, they were saying. They weren't saying that. But in essence, when you say, oh, the very thing that God says is yours and you say, oh, it's not quite ours because if we go in there, we're going to die. You just doubted God. You just said God is not able. Pretty much saying God is not able by your belief in, in, the, in the contrary. And so this is what the elders uh, uh, reported and they did not make it. Now the young people are kind of like fidgeting. They're kind of like working the, the human nature is working on the inside of them again and that human nature is being called back to that's why it says on the other side of the flood and so i believe that to be a foreshadow of our own human nature how yes we were delivered from this world but we're still connected to this world and so because of this connection that we have to the world it's in parallel to the connection that even them on a human level have a connection to sin and to the old ways uh, before the flood. This is why it's mentioned that way in that language. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood. He keeps saying it and people don't, I, I don't think people really understand what that means. It's a nature that they brought even though that they were not at in the on the other side of this flood, 
It's the nature that they brought on the other side of the flood, the good side of the flood, the, the surviving side of the flood, meaning all the people that did not survive, they had the exact same human nature as the people who made it over. Noah, his sons and his wives, and, and his sons' wives and his wife all had the same human nature that all the people that drowned before the flood had. And so that human nature is pretty much all uh, pretty is being presented here. So when you see that idea of serving, you know, like like your fathers on this side of the, on the other side of the flood, that's that's saying something. And in Egypt, now this is just another his, historical event. This is now not just pre-flood, but now it's about Egypt because he's making a point about our human nature. And so he says, we, uh, put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt. So not only did they did they uh, move over from from um, from that side of the flood who, who the, their father served. Now, let me uh, let me just look at something real quick, because I think. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Because it could be said that they were go going over a flood, but it wasn't a flood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. I didn't mean to digress. To, uh, I didn't mean to, you know, pause like that. Okay. So, verse the latter part of verse 14, and serve ye the Lord. Now, they're saying put away all your, your human tendency to go back to other gods and other explanation of things. And also from your experiential human nature, meaning not just the human nature, your innate human nature on the inside, the Adamic nature that cleaves to sin and wants to do wrong, but also your experiential knowledge of sin or things that is not right, you know, things that you know by paper, by what is being taught. And so the things on the other side of the flood is human nature. It's Adamic nature. Uh, but Egypt is experiential. It's something taught. It is something that is not so far off. It's not so, um, it's not that, um, that much uh, divorced from their reality. Egypt is a reality to them. Egypt was a place that they could actually go back to if they wanted to and be under submission to their, their gods and their rulership, their pharaohs. And so this is something that is more experiential. Now he's saying, put away your gods from your Adamic nature, your, the pull of your nature to try to explain away God and do your own thing. That's Adamic nature. But when it mentions, and in Egypt, that's experiential. That's the thing that you have come to come to all uh, feel with your flesh with your own two eyes see things with your own eyes and smell excuse me i got to focus my camera uh smell with your own nose taste with your own mouth things you handle yourself in your own lifetime knowing what egypt was all about he says put away those gods that were in egypt that 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 that, that is calling back to you because although things seem bad here Although those things, um, although these things seem like it's a terrible thing to, um, you know, because we're in this new land and all these people, these Canaan lands, these giants on the earth, they're very scary. But God is saying, no, what I've already protected. I've, I've moved you from one side of the flood to a next to teach you a lesson, to bring you to, to you know, to bear in mind that God is real and that he requires you to listen to his word. Not only that, but I have brought your elders, your people out of Egypt so that you can know of a surety that I am the one that has led you out by a right, by his, by his powerful right hand. And so verse 15, I'm trying to wrap it up. I'm, I'm like long winded. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord. Now, Joshua is pretty much making the case, if this seems evil to you, like you know what's right and wrong, you have been given the, the, the law. You know what God has delivered you from. God has delivered you from piracy, 
from famine, from thirst. And, and he has led you in the wilderness. A pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He has, he has pretty much sacked all your enemies for you. Before you and after you and, and to, the, to the left and the right of you. He has, le he has led you along a narrow way, but narrowly has defeated everything. And it wasn't because you were such a great militaristic people. It wasn't because, because when you came out of Egypt, you were just builders. You were just agriculturalists. You were just people who tended flock. You did not have anything to do with military. But Moses took you out having a military mindset, knowing Egyptian ways. God delivered you out of that land through Moses and has now forwarded the, the power of Moses onto Joshua and has now built you up in such a way that you can fortify yourselves as a people. And from all tribes, get you strong men and be and stand in your strength that I have called you in. I, I know I'm, I'm going. I, I know. I know. So Joshua is now saying, in place of God, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, Yahweh, choose you this day whom you will serve. You have a clear choice, a clear cut choice. There is no blurred lines. There is no blended uh, viewpoint. There is no gray area. It's either you serve the one God or you go back and serve whatever your imagination leads you to serve. Because whatever your, imagina and your imagination leads you to serve, they are false gods. If it's that wooden block over there, it's that bird-headed thing that, that came from Egypt. If it's cats, or if it's an animal, a beast, a cow. And I'm mentioning these, these beasts because these are actual uh, tokens of religions that they actually serve. Like in Hinduism, Hinduism the Hindis, um, they, they, they think a cow is sacred. They think this. No, a cow is not sacred. A cow is a created thing by the one true and living God. This is the choice that he is now presenting to them. All this time, it has not been, it has not been, this God has delivered you from rain, and this God delivered you from sand, sandblast. This God has delivered you from time. This God has delivered you from, there is no such gods. God has made it very abundantly clear to these people that it is a God by the name of Yahweh, the I am that I am has taken them out of Egypt and he has sanctified himself among this people, among the rulers of this people, Moses being the, the primary person, then Joshua now, he has sanctified himself and his name among this people and among the world that's looking on because Moses taught us that the world is looking at us. And if we come into this wilderness and you kill us all, all day, what is the world going to think? You would, your name would be reproached. It would be a shame. And so God did not go ahead with, you know, killing all the, all the people. He just killed all the elders and let the young people come. And here we have the young people coming into their own. And Joshua is reiterating the things that Moses has already taught them. Moses, again, is dead. And so he says, choose you, uh, if it seem evil to serve the Lord, choose you this day. Whom you will serve. Because this is the day. This is the dividing day. This is the, the line of demarcation. We go, uh, we go forward from here. If you want to go backwards. You go backwards on your own. As for me and my house. Joshua and my house. Look. I'm my own person. I'm going to make my own decision. But I'm also the head of my family. And I'm going to drag my family with me into safety. Because I have a good head on my shoulder. And my good head on my shoulder is presented to, to me by Yahweh. The only reason I got a good head on my shoulder is because Yahweh is my God. If Yahweh is not your God, and if you think Yahweh is evil, then go ahead and serve whatever you want to serve. But you're going to, be, you're going to depart from me. You're going to separate your ties from me. You're going to separate your ties from this people, this, this vision of the nation of Israel. 
You will no longer be a part of this. Go your way. But we're going into this land and we're going to take it. The land that we now occupy is ours. And we're going to spread throughout it all. It's ours. And if you don't have the guts to go through with this mission, then choose you this day. Because if God is not your God, then I don't know what to tell you. Take a hike. This is what Joshua is saying. He's not just saying, oh, look, no, if you don't, well, you can come with us if you like, but you know, no, he wants total commitment from 100% of the people as they go into this land, because this land is 100% theirs. It has been ever since he promised it to Abraham, ever since Abraham was treading on it and even meeting other people and going to war with other people in the, in the, in the, in the King's Dale. You know, and, and going to rescue his, his nephew Lot. All of that was happening in the Canaan lands. And throughout all these years, from that point up until this point, there was a um, there were people still nomadically traveling through these lands, thinking that whatever plot that they 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 were on, it was theirs. Sad to say it was not theirs. Because it was always God's intention to give it to a certain people. And he had made this promise to a man who the people will come from. And this man is their father, Abraham, which we see in verse 3a. I took your father, Abraham, from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and multiplied his seed. Now, how do I how do I know that that was true? Look around you. Joshua is saying, look around you, your father multiplied his seed because God said so. Your father actually had a land and this is the land that we're on. And why? Because God said so. Your father, uh, not only was your father Abraham promised this, but your other father Isaac was promised this. And your other father Jacob was promised it. And your other fathers, all 12 of the men of the house of Israel including Joseph, who took all the children of Israel for himself in the land of Egypt to protect them from famine. But then 400 years later, was um, they became slaves, but it was time to go, was delivered into the hand of Moses as their champion, as their prophet, as the, the, the ruler, has now gotten them to the point where he was at the end of the, uh, at the brink of the land of Canaan, could not make it himself, he forwarded all his authority and power to Joshua. Joshua now is re reverberating, re re reiterating. I can't even talk anymore. I'm a little excited about this. And so Joshua is now saying, look, the same was true for Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the children of Israel, and Joseph, and all the people in between. No matter what land they were in, God was still their God all throughout. His word was still in motion. His word has come to pass. Look, I've seen enough. Me, as my, my name is Joshua, I have seen enough. I have seen enough to say, I, I've seen enough, heard enough, experienced enough. I, I've heard all the stories. I don't need your, your garbage gods. And I'm going to say it like that. Every other God except for Yahweh, if you can, if you deem them gods, are garbage gods. They are no good. There is a demon behind the facade of them all. The, everything that you have been taught, if, you, if you're if you an otherwise believer, and if you don't believe in Jesus, but you somehow caught a hold of this video, and, and you believe in another god, believe in some element believe in some form of god or forms of god if you believe in anything other than what the bible has has already made certain yahweh is god yahweh has come in flesh and his name is jesus yeshua and so yeshua is yahweh our salvation yahweh himself has saved us yahweh himself has spoken his word in times past through the fathers to the fathers by the prophets in these last days by his son which we know is the manifestation of god himself speaking to humanity jesus is the word of god manifest in flesh 
I hope that 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 the way I just said that makes perfect sense to you. Otherwise, I can't say anything else more. But it jumps on now to verse 21. And the people said unto Joshua, now they're answering Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. Now, see how people are gung-ho in the beginning? Always gung-ho. It, it always turns out that way. And we, we see the, the history of Israel, how they were gung-ho. They needed help. And they got the help and it was like, yes, God did it for us. We're gung-ho in the faith. We're going to go all the way. Well, I'm going all the way. I'm going all the way with Jesus. This is what we say today. And then we, we find ourselves getting a little comfortable with the times, getting comfortable with the world. And then the world again becomes more um, appealing to our flesh. And then little by little, it starts to call and beckon us because guess where we come from? We come from this fallen world. Our flesh is a product of this earth. And what we desire and cater, uh, what we want our bodies to cater to is the things of this world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. We are always called back to it through the flesh. We have to love God in spirit and in truth. We have to love God. To love God is to believe in God. And to believe in God is to be spiritual. And if you're spiritual, that means you are apt to believe everything that this God has spoken to you about. Through whether it be the word of God or a preacher sent by God to preach the word. The word of God is come. And the only way we can adhere to the word or listen to the word of God is if we incline our hearts and our ears to hear what God has, has to say. I think he actually goes on to say something like that in verse 24. And so verse 22 says, And Joshua said unto the people, You are witnesses against yourself. Now he's, being, he's, he's, he's affidaviting them. Anybody know what an affidavit is? You write a statement and then you get it notarized. And you sign off on it in front of a notary public because now, not necessarily a notary public, but anyone who has authority to be a witness to the signing of a document and, and have a seal or a docu um, or a stamp or something that they are witnessing what you wrote and signed yourself. And so this is where Joshua is. He's the notary public of the Lord. He is now saying, okay, you wrote this. You said nay, but we will serve the Lord. Now you sign on the dotted line and I'm going to stamp it. But you're a witness against yourself as well. I'm a witness and you're a witness against yourself. And so he, he says that you have chosen you the Lord to serve him. Not only do we make choice, choice that God is our God, but when we say God is our God and that we made him our choice, that means we serve him in every way. And so this is what they're saying. They affidavit themselves. And they say, we are witnesses. Signed on the dotted line. Now, therefore, put away. This is Joshua saying to them. Now, therefore, put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you. So this means that they did, in some way, allow these things to creep into the camp. Creep in, you know, uh, little by little here and there among the people, their imaginations, their machinations, they're creating for themselves a, a, um, a God for circumstances, for things that they, they, they think was something else other than Yahweh delivering them. So they did have other gods among them. Otherwise, the scripture would not say now, therefore, put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you. Uh, and incline your heart, incline not only your heart, but when you when you incline your heart, it is a given that your heart had to hear something. How shall they believe on whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear and say, like somebody preached? You know, that's something in Romans, right? Romans chapter eight, I believe. It says, oh, put away those strange gods among you and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel, Yahweh, Elohim of Israel. And so he's saying, incline your heart to God. Love God. Just like in last week's lesson, 
He says, love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. Remember how I, I, I broke that down. Your heart is your spirit man. It's what opens you up to spiritual things. And so your heart has to be renewed first, spiritually. This is why you must be born of the water and of the spirit. You must be born Holy Ghost filled. You must be baptized in the spirit. However synonymous terms you want to use, you got to have the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit is the spirit that connects you to an invisible God. Who is that, that spirit? That spirit is the same spirit. It's the same spirit that was in the Old Testament is now in the New Testament, except now in the New Testament, people, all they have to do is believe in uh, Jesus and be saved through the Spirit. And so we see that in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39. We see that in the, in the, um, the, the you know, in the chapters after that, how these people were added to the church, meaning they were saved by receiving the Holy Ghost and they received the Holy Ghost the way the Bible said they received the Holy Ghost. And guess how you receive the Holy Ghost today? Is it some new way? No. God is doing the same thing he did from the book of Acts today. Miracles still happen. I don't care if your name is John MacArthur. You need to strike down these false teachers. Anyway, I, I kind of, I'm sorry. Let me get a hold of myself. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and his voice will we obey. So not only is your heart involved, but it's also inclining your ear to what the word of God says. And your, your purpose in life is to get all the word of God that you could possibly get in your life. Read it for yourself. Go as many times as you want. I'm not saying it's um I'm not saying that this is a prerequisite to salvation, but going to church helps. It's not a prerequisite for salvation. You don't have to go to a church building to be saved. But I I I got I, I must warn you that if you go on in life long enough, you will eventually get hurt along the way and you need to go to a hospital. Am I am I mistaken in saying this? If I'm wrong, somebody correct me. In this life that I have lived, I'm now 41 years old. I have been hurt a couple of times. I had to be hospitalized. Uh, I had to be corrected. You know, there were rules in life that I need to adhere to and be and be taught. And so there is school, there is hospitals. There is police departments. There's all these things that teach us in some kind of way that we need to learn and set our for ourselves boundaries. And these people had it. They, they, they did not have boundaries before God and they were doing whatever they wanted to do. They were serving their imaginations and creating for themselves other gods and, and creating for themselves a platform in their heart for another God other than the real God who actually created them you know the god who created the cow you are now worshiping a cow instead of worshiping the god who created the cow you're worshiping water elements fire wind instead of the god who created these elements you're worshiping yourselves and guess what you yourself is created by god it is he who has made us and not we ourselves and so with that being said, the, the, again, the lesson's title was Love and Serve God. And this is a, a dialogue between Joshua and the new generation of people that has entered into Canaan lands. They're about to live this life under God, a theocracy. And they were about to be proven by God time and time and time again. That God is their God and he will protect them and keep them as close to him, him as as godly possible without, you know, messing up their their choice, their freedom of choice. There's another aspect of this lesson that uh, Joshua makes it very clear that they have a choice. 
that God is not taking anybody by the ear and say, serve me, serve me. There, there is a faction in Christianity that says, look, God chose you. You can't do nothing about it. Oh, contraire. God chose you before the foundation of the world. That's because he already knew you would make a decision. But along this life, you don't know what God knows. You have to, by your own free will, untainted by God. God will not disturb your free will. But he already knows your, the choices you have made. And he has, has, has had his pleasure in you on the other side of eternity where you are not. And so it's one thing to say, look, I, I'm going to serve God until I die. I'm going to serve God and, and blah, blah, blah. But you cannot say I can live any old kind of way because once I got saved, I got saved. And there ain't nobody going to tell me I'm different. I can smoke, you know, heroin. I can I can drink all kinds of stuff. I can live this life and that life. I can go a whoring at the idols. I can go a whoring at the females and males or bofa. And you know, uh, I'm not, bofa, that's another thing. Uh, that's that's a uh, stupid inside joke that just came out of my mouth. All these things left to ourselves, we would be in trouble. And guess what? We still need to pivot and repent and turn to the one God to make our life go from chaos to peaceful and serene, making our choices, you know, because we got so many things in front of us in this life. You got, you got this choice to sin this way, sin that way, sin that way, sin this way, sin the other way, sin two times as much, sin three times as much, sin uh, exponentially larger than that person is all of these choices that you can make in life. But all these choices are the road to death and you will die in your sin. But if you make your choice, God, you have now made all your choices condensed into one. You have now focused your attention on one. It's a no wonder that there are people who are teaching that God is three that God is um, is tripart, that God is seven, that God is 20, that God is all these hosts, that God could be many things to many people, but he is basically one God. No, God is still just one God. And guess what this one God will do? Because he has the power, he has the omnipot omnipotence, he has the omnipresence, and he has the omniscience, he has the ability in and of himself to by himself reach out with his own right hand and save you right where you are. No matter where you are. No matter what time of day it is. No matter if it's dark or light. No matter whether you're in the fire or you are in safety. No matter whether you're in the flood or outside on dry land. No matter whether you're in space or in our, you know, uh, our, um, our atmosphere. Look, it does not matter. God is able by his blood to get you and save you. But you still have a choice. If it seem evil to you to serve that one Lord. Remember, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. One Lord. How many? One. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods, you know, Elohim. Again, the word Elohim appears here, gods. But is in context, it's talking about the various many gods. As opposed to the one God who is Elohim himself, capital E. And so with that being said, love that one God with all your heart, your soul, and your might. Love him, and because your love is so pronounced in that very way, you will be able to serve him. And in doing so, you will, you will, you will accomplish so much more. The word of God will be true for you as it was for any of these patriarchs in the Old Testament and any of these people, apostles, disciples in the New Testament. God is your God too. He is the one God. Love and serve him. God bless you. I hope you enjoyed that lesson. I'm sorry I was late with this lesson. God bless you all. Bye-bye.